Well, the village of Elstonfield and St Peter's Church is somewhere I've wanted to visit for a while since first reading about it. There's so much here and I wasn't disappointed. Elstonfield village is built on a very ancient site and this present name is derived from the Saxon meaning Elstan's open land. And the village's Saxon occupation is indicated by the fortified hill farms which can be seen overlooking the valley and by the, the many lynchets which is a name given to areas of the hillside which have been levelled so the crops can be grown. The Peak District itself is named after the Anglo-Saxon tribe, the Pexteatins, or hill dwellers, who occupied the region around the 6th century. And the tribe advanced up the valley of the rivers Derwent and the Dorf during the Northern Conquest. Now going back further in time, there's a prominent uh, burial barrow known as Steep Low, and it's just to the west of the village. And it was investigated by the antiquarian Thomas Bateman in the past. And from these limited investigations, they found two Bronze Age burials, five cremations and some pottery and some random Roman coins. But Steeplow is, is more famous because it's one of the last places in England where a gibbet was used for executions. Surrounded by dry stone walls and overlooking the River Dove, St Peter's Church is on very ancient land, possibly sacred land before the Romans came. And the church has a number of Romanesque features, such as an arch and other various architectural fragments built into the walls, including a shield in the gig. I'll tell you about her later. Now the, the site of the church goes back to 667 when St Chad visited the area and in 892 St Oswald, the Archbishop, uh, Archbishop of York, visited the parish to perform a dedication of St Peter's and to renew confidence in Christianity. And the village was mentioned in the Doomsday Book and it was a centre of trade as many pack horse tracks passed close by. And these pack horse routes were so well trodden that they formed hollow ways. They must have been ancient. And the various fragments of Saxon crosses at St Peter's are set to date from 900, very shortly after the visit of St Oswald. The two of the cross shafts are outside in the churchyard. The second is round the back of the church. It's been reused as a sundial. And there are three fragments which have been incorporated into the front porch. And I think the central fragment seems to be by far the earliest. Now most of the fragments have the characteristic Saxon knotwork carving. And are possibly the largest collection of Saxon carved stones in the country. Most of them parts of standing crosses. Inside the church, there's the, the cross fragments. Many seem to be unfinished, leading experts to believe that the crosses were actually carved on site and that there may have been some kind of school of carving here. And under this jumble of cross fragments, there's a, a six-sided Saxon font, I think there's an eight-sided bowl, a Saxon stone coffin, and most of this is thought to have been created for the, for the very early Saxon church. We'll probably talk back as we found it. Now all these Saxon artefacts, and there were loads of them, were in the corner of the church. Uh, they were piled up and covered with cloths to protect them. 
We gently uncovered them and uh, piled the thing back when we'd done. But it was a bit cramped in the corner, a little bit dark, so excuse the images. Some of these haven't been finished. So they reckon it was a school of carving. Then St. Ain was the same earlier, old stone. Now we have what I was going to tell you about earlier, what I promised about the shield in the gig. Now this was amongst the pile of cross fragments piled up in the corner. It's now mounted into the wall of the church and it's a rare, very old and quite mysterious sacred carving. And the figure, it's hard to make out, but it's of a monster eating someone with only the legs and buttocks protruding from the mouth. And the monster's head is said to be Romanesque. So that tells you how old it could be. Now this motif of someone being eaten by a monstrous head is reasonably common in religious Romanesque sculptures. Uh, Devises church it as a similar monstrous figure with legs protruding from the mouth. Something Cara might want to look out for an open-minded wanderer. Now a person being eaten is very much a symbol of sin and damnation. A number of Romanesque manuscripts and sculptures show the damned within the jaws of huge monsters. I'm not sure, but this Sheila Niggy may be unique with the addition of the exhibitionist figure. A pair of arms holding open what appears to be the lady parts between the legs of the figure, which is said to be what really signifies lust and damnation. It seems to be a bit of a cross between Christianity and paganism. The, the, the intrigue with these things do. Yeah, I wonder if it's an old funeral cart. Now we also have this in the graveyard. It's a gravestone of Anne Green, who died in 1518. It's reputedly the oldest readable gravestone in the country. It's circular in shape with wording carved along the edge. Not too far away there are two other similar graves, gravestones, but the two worn to read. So they may have been older, but who knows. Now this is the family mausoleum of Robert Bill and his family. I haven't been able to find a lot out, but Robert Bill may have been the bloke who constructed the one's priory mill, which refined flour for the monks at St Michael's Church in Stone in around 1795. Detail on it, lovely. Mm. This is the same place where a bloke called Richard Stoney Smith, who father run the mill, was the inventor of Hovis bread. Which will be how Robert Bill made his fortune and his claim to fame. <laughs> 